Welcome to CalCast, your creator national podcast. Episode 167. Welcome, GNN fans, to another episode of God Network News, the podcast that tells you what God's doing around the world, not what CNN tells you, but what GNN tells you is going on in the world. If you're tired of listening to all of that crisis network news and you want to hear what God's doing, well, give us a listen. Steve Addison is a great podcaster and very passionate about movements of peoples to Christ. And Steve has his own podcast, very successful podcast, with over 226 podcast episodes. And the name of his podcast is On the Road to No Place Left. And we highly recommend that you subscribe to his podcast because he has an overwhelming library of exciting topics related to movements. And if you want to learn more about movements, movements. This is the place to find the information and he has lots of training and tools and other resources that will really make your investigation of this topic successful. So we really want to thank Steve Addison and his partners there at movements.net forward slash podcast. That's how you can find it at movements.net forward slash podcast for all of the resources that he has given us for these next few podcasts. Thank you very much, Steve. Right now, there's about 650 movements around the world that are at least fourth generation. Fourth generation of churches. Yes, about 650. This this data comes from uh, my work with a network called 2414 Initiative. It's a fairly new initiative. Obviously, 2414 is taken from Matthew 2414. But all that we did was we uh, we started talking to some of our friends and say, would you mind sharing uh, the languages and, and locations where you have movements. And of course, if, if you don't feel like you can do that, um, you can tell us at the country level, or you can tell us at the, the affinity level or the cluster level, whatever level you want to tell us. But how many movements would you say that you have that are fourth generation? And then the next level was to screen through those and look at uh, where there may be some duplications. And what we found was 650 that are fourth generation believers are beyond. So along with that movement comes increased concern for, well, what is moving and what is multiplying? You know, uh, a movement is fine and multiplication of cells is fine, but you want to make sure that those cells, whether believers or churches, are healthy and not cancerous. Mm. We don't want the cancer growing. Mm. Um, and uh, sometimes it may be very, very healthy. Sometimes it's not. So we we go in and we a lot we ask people when we when we hear some something about this that so and so does they have a thousand churches. Okay, well that's far more than we had in mind. Could we go in and do an assessment? But I, you know, one year the biggest year I think I had twenty three assessments, twenty three global assessments to do. Uh, we can't. My department. We can't go and do those kinds of assessments, but we wanted to look into them. So we do a lot of uh, training like we're doing here, where um, where maybe uh, you're a client and you say, hey, Jim, could IMB help us assess whether or not we have a CPM going on here, uh, where the strengths are, maybe where the barriers are that we're facing. So I've written an article in Lausanne World Pulse called Integrity and Accountability in Reporting Mission Statistics. And I think sometimes the integrity and accountability problems begin with us when we go in and we expect oral learners or people who want to please us uh, to give us a report. 
on the extent of what uh, their work has 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 seen and then they they give the post to us and we then report them so a lot of times that puts me in a position here in global research to hear some fantastic reports uh that may or may not be happening mm -hmm. so whenever we hear about those incongruencies and we all you know when we get together at meetings or we we go to some global assembly or some global or regional meeting we're always talking you know across the dinner table and we're always hearing these kinds of things is yeah yeah I've heard that too but you know, something about that just doesn't make any sense to me. I wonder if we could get together a group of guys and and maybe train them on the internet through a Zoom call or something like that. Go through the assessment tool, put together a methodology, find some dates that we could go in and interview some people. And I've been doing a lot of training like that, helping helping teams to go. And the, the real value of that. And who's that report for? That's a that's a legitimate question here. The report is for the team. So if I come in and I lead a team to do an assessment of somebody else's work and uh, we finish that assessment, we give that assessment to that team and nobody else sees that assessment unless that team decides to redact it and share it. That's that's kind of the rule here mm. is that we're really not trying to make a name or trying to shoot somebody down or, try to, you know, validate this or that or we're not we're not assessors. We can't see everything. We're only an external team, and so we want to give the value of that assessment to the team so that they can enhance the things that are working well for them through the stories that are told to us or uh, take on some of the barriers full, full on so that they can uh, maybe get past a hurdle and, and, and see a CPM. Age. And at the end of the age, he's going to come back, and he's going to say, and his, he's, he's taught, taught his disciples, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? That we also have a part in helping to understand whether or not when the Lord returns, he will find faith among the languages, people, tribes, and nations that he is called to be his own, that he died for. So we have a part in understanding what God's doing among his peoples. Without that, we can't know that we're really mm -hmm. making disciples of every language, people, tribe, and nation. So that's a call not just to evaluate, but to appreciate, to acknowledge the great things that Christ is doing. And I can tell you this, while we have been disappointed in some numbers that were overreported that we found during assessments, we've been far more thrilled than discouraged with the exciting things that God's doing among people that we did not know had the level of maturity and understanding that they do. And, and could, uh, that we have four purposes in doing an assessment. We want to accurately describe the history, nature, and extent of a movement. And uh, sometimes we have a dissertation. Uh, Roy Oxnavad's dissertation of Iranians in the diaspora. Uh, somebody else's dissertation on the peoples, uh, all the Kurdish peoples, or the Bengalis, or whatever. So we, ha we, has we, we do a review of whatever literature is available. But we also have reports from there, sometimes numeric reports, sometimes interviews. And so um, we also want to uh, bring in to the assessment for interviews or go out to these people. Uh, we want to get that extra piece of data that comes from, from them. And that is nothing other than their story. The people we talk to, uh, these are the human documents. These are the people bringing testimony of the acts of, the, of today's apostles. And so we want to interview the human documents. They're part of our review of literature and especially people who had their stories of what Christ has done in their life. We want to hear about that. And, and then we want to judge from all of those that are available to us, the extent of the movement. And so sometimes uh, it appears from the outside that movements have even failed or faltered because maybe they plateaued in the number numbers that are there. And oftentimes what we find in an assessment is, while our understanding may have plateaued, there's things that where the white fire or red hot fire of the gospel has burned beyond the horizon of our awareness. It is still burning just as fast as it ever did, but we can't see past our own horizon to know what the extent of the movement is. So we allow people to tell us that and then build time into the assessment where we can actually go to where they say there's another part of the stream or another stream of the CPM. And then we'll go there and interview as well. 
or maybe we find out something entirely different and we're interviewing over here. And then the stories we're hearing are very similar to what we heard a couple of weeks ago, 500 miles away. And then maybe you find out that, well, the reason for that is because that movement sent a trainer over there or the, 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 the fire somehow jumped, you know, and, and there you have it. And you see that by in the stories of the people, you see common threads or common training materials. So the first thing about an assessment is to describe the history, nature, and extent of the movement by whatever information is available. Next, to describe and evaluate the faith and practice of church in the movement, especially taking note of what are the things that they're doing that are uh, according to the essentials of what it means to be a New Testament disciple or church, and what are the extra biblical or extra polity standards that have been introduced uh, within the uh, lives of the disciples or the, the churches. Number three, we look for effective strategies and practices that may benefit other work. So this would be the fruitful practices sort of thing, where there was no church, where there's now a church. Uh, how, how is it happening? Hmm. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's even possible here. And then we hear some story. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, that's, that's a strategy we would have never even thought about, um, you know, using micro SD cards in phones bought in the market. Uh, among a population that has 90% oral learners. It doesn't make sense, but they have that kind of technology and they know how to use it. You're listening to God Network News Podcast with your host, Cal Curtis. Look up our website at godnetworknews.com. They're there taking your picture during the assessment with their cell phone. Wow, this person doesn't even know how to read. Uh, and then finally, number four, to suggest interventions needed to address current issues or to avert future ones. So all assessments, you know, have these tears that are winding themselves around the movement, trying to stop it or drag it down. So sometimes when you do an assessment, you hear people's stories, you find out that, wow, if we could just take on one or two problems they're facing, this thing could begin to move again. So um, this is just my call out to all your audience and people who are your, your church planning practitioners, that you guys are the ones who who are planting churches. You know the kinds of things that are working. You know the types of interventions that are needed oftentimes. When we get together, uh, we'll see different church planters in their movements along different stages of the missionary task. Some are just now entering, and they really don't know how to enter. They're just casting the seed, and they, they don't know what to do with that. Others are facing um, you know, incredible uh, stresses and tears uh, you know, that are wrapping themselves around the movement. And uh, they need the encouragement of how to how to deal with that and how to how to navigate those those sorts of things. Others are dealing with parables of, of parables of the kingdom sorts of things. The sower, the tares, the you know the treasure, the pearl, uh, the leaven. Uh, yeah. So they're they're thinking about uh, how can the king how can this be a kingdom movement, not just a church planning movement, but a kingdom movement as well with the principles of the kingdom at work, and then. How, how can we do our best, uh, like Paul did with the epistles, to um, avert future problems or, you know, even face current problems, but, but basically to keep this thing on track? And so all those things come into a, a church planting assessment. So the idea of the assessment then is to do the methodology that guarantees that you can get that information to the best of your, not, best of your ability without doing any harm, and then bring that report back to the team as an encouragement and as, an, as a challenge. One thing. I think I, I, I kind of have a top 10 here of, of things that are, mm. are CPM stoppers. And uh, I share this sometimes, and let me just go through these really, really quickly. Uh, unfruitful practices really that prevent the possibility of seeing a CPM. Number one, the, the specialization in missions today, that if you are a researcher, or a mobilizer, an organizer, an administrator, a dynamic leader, or, or a resource provider, that you are exempt from making disciples of lost people. A lot of us feel that because of the role that we have, that we're somehow exempt from making disciples of lost people. Teams need people, individuals on their team, where everyone realizes that is, is their God-given duty to make disciples of lost people, number one. 
Number two, another thing that bleeds uh, possibilities of seeing a CPM, spending too much time on things that do not make disciples of lost people. And here I'm treading on thin ice, I know, but family, organizing your video library. Uh, guys, I've seen, uh, I've, I've stayed in houses where there were far more videos than, than, than uh, anything else. And it seemed like that was the, the priority or spending, maybe spending time on the computer. Number three, overemphasizing that you must gain cultural awareness before making disciples of lost people. Paul learned a lot about culture as he walked around Athens, but he never got very far until he quit dating and started sharing the gospel. And I think a lot of times we spend more time on language and cultural awareness. We just simply don't get around to sharing the gospel a lot of times. Number four, sending missionaries to make disciples of lost people and planting churches who have not done this prior to their missionary experience, sending people that don't know how to disciple or plant churches. Number five, the missionary teams are stuck on seeing little fruit. We'll see fruit one day if they remain on the field. I think there's that assumption too. Just keep just keep doing things as you've been doing. Um, and And... Finally, there will be a breakthrough someday. No, sorry, that's true. There may be a breakthrough from the Holy Spirit, but a lot of missionary teams are stuck and they'll continue to be stuck until somebody goes in and, and helps them uh, so that they can get through the barriers that they're facing. We have, we have responsibility to help each other to navigate the barriers that we find as church planters. Number six, a lot of teams don't see CPMs because they don't know a lot of lost people or they're witnessing to them or praying for them in the last 24 hours. Number seven, we aim too low. I often see churches where there are four, four old women and one old man who's usually blind and a bunch of children. We need to be asking God for a man of peace who will, bring, who will believe and bring you to community leaders. Like Barnabas, we don't only go after Saul. We're afraid of him, even when we hear he has become a believer. So we need to uh, go, after the, go after the people who have influence. Number eight, one of the reasons we don't see CPMs, we have a fuzzy vision for why we're on the field. To engage, multiply churches, see them join in the Great Commission. Um, so we really, we really um, have a fuzzy vision of what we want to see happen. Number nine, that I have to know the worldview language and sell my father's cow before I can begin to witness the lost people. So I've already said this, but it's, I just said it in a different way. And then number 10, one of the things that can keep you from seeing a CPM is anything short of preparing your people as if the king is coming. So um, these are uh, things that prevent us, and I would encourage you also to think in your own ministry – what are the things that you're doing or but that have been introduced somehow into what you're trying to do that really is preventing the yeast from infecting the whole the whole loaf? It could be your eschatology. It could be your hermeneutic. It could be uh, uh, what your goal is. It could be that you don't think that God can bring you a CPM. That, that, so, so you don't think there's going to be any results. So what do you do when somebody says, can you share the gospel with me? I could, but I may lose my visa or who's watching me. Or, you know, we, we get afraid. We get we get terrified because of where we are in these areas. And one of the things that I've seen in movements is an overwhelming boldness of Bengali Muslims, of Lingayats, of Bojpuri, of Maasai, of Kabil Berbers, of uh, Amharic in Ethiopia, you name it, an overwhelming boldness to say that a, 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 a lack of voice is greater persecution for me than using my voice and being persecuted because I've used it. So uh, let's be as bold as our national partners, and uh, perhaps maybe we'll see something. You know, what's the, the rate of growth, even over the last 10 years, in the numbers of fourth-generation movements around the world? 
Well, movements are um, exponential in their increase uh, within themselves. And I think the uh, all the movements are also moving exponentially. Um, back in the, I don't even think we were using those terms. There were things called church planting movements, but um, not not with the same universals that we've had for the last 20 years. Um, I just, uh, again, like I said, there weren't that many back then because I think that we, we were operating under a, a different uh, paradigm of uh, incremental church planting uh, and where a lot of a lot of work really wasn't focused even on church planting. We just felt like we couldn't get into those countries. And one of the reasons we weren't seeing many movements back then was because the church had pretty much uh, matured where it was going to mature. And uh, those fields were stable and movements depend on instability. Uh, instability not only in in the geopolitical climate, perhaps there, but instability in the lives of people who are under under persecution, under severe um, social stresses, uh, who are hopeless. They they've never had an opportunity to find out that there's hope available to them. Just the whole idea that we would enter into a world where there's been a severe injustice, and the severe mercy uh, is that. While that's come at a horrible expense for uh, many people who've gone into those areas, is that um, there there are movements today where you would not expect movements to happen. Um, so getting back to before 2000, I I wouldn't we we hadn't assessed any for sure. Had there been movements? Yes, there had been movements in South Korea, there had been movements in uh, Nigeria, and in, in even in India, in the Philippines, in Brazil. Uh, Nigeria, I mean, wonderful partners in these places. Uh, and partly one of the reasons we're seeing movements today is because the majority world is uh, becoming involved. We used to have a saying among Southern Baptists, give us a million more and we'll plant one more. A million dollars more and we'll plant one more. That was our motto. A million more, we'll plant one more. And unfortunately today, uh, the human resources and resources are coming from the indigenous harvest uh, field, now become the harvest force. enjoyed this episode, please consider donating to help us continue to bring exciting stories fresh from the field. Visit our website at godnetworknews.com and select the PayPal link on the right side of the page or consider becoming a Patreon partner to receive access to more valuable materials exclusive to our members.